Hello, and welcome to another episode of Boundless Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, and today we have another amazing guest to introduce to you now. Tia Reed is the Director of Nutritional Services, Services at Memorial Hospital in Chester, Illinois. As a certified health coach practitioner, Tia is passionate to guide others on their individual journeys to wellness. She specializes in helping clients focus on low carbohydrate, healthy fat, keto nutrition to heal their bodies, especially those that have prediabetes, NAFLD, or battle with weight and carbohydrate or food addiction. Her goal is to encourage, guide, and help clients sustain health, metabolic health by eating real whole foods while helping them with long-lasting behavior change for sustainable weight management. Tia has, has over 35 years experience in service-based environments, from owning a restaurant and hotel to currently working in a hospital setting as the Director of Nutritional Services. Tia is enthusiastic to offer her clients the therapeutic option of low-carbohydrate nutrition. She also serves as a Nutrition Network Coach Practitioner, accredited by the Society of Metabolic Practitioner, and as a certified and licensed sugar professional through Bitten Johnson, who is known as the international expert in carb and sugar addiction. Tia Reed, what an absolute honor it is to welcome you to Balanced Body Radio. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for today and allowing me to be here. I'm honored and I'm excited. And I just want to thank you for sending your message of hope. Um, out to the world and letting people such as myself that's had a journey share with others so that they can help themselves. How magical well, is that? <laughs> it's it's so fun. And it's so fun to connect with people like you that have amazing stories. And I just have to say, you have to be one of the nicest human beings I've ever met in my entire life. <laughs> this story to me is so funny. I told Tracy McBeath when we had her on the other week, I, I'm in the hallways of low carb Denver, you know, people are everywhere. And it's like, a, you know, a lot of whole balloon going on and noise and everything and you're seeing all your friends and I hear this this voice like hey can I get a picture with you it's you I want a picture and I'm like oh shoot I gotta get out of the way like get me out of here uh, <laughs> you know Mark Cucuzzello might be walking behind me or Sean Baker or somebody that somebody would really want to take a picture with and so I was trying to move away and you were like no it was with me like what you want to take a picture with me why so great yeah, you're awesome <laughs> Jeez. of course well, it would be good <laughs> That, for that reason alone, you have a lifetime invite to our show anytime. I might not invite anybody else. No, like, I'm just going to invite you every time just to make my, make make myself feel better. You know, it's funny about that because I saw you from really from afar. I'm like, man, that's Casey Ruff. I am getting my picture. That is hilarious. That is the first and I can guarantee the very last time that will ever, ever, ever happen. So I'm going to cherish no, gonna, it while I have it. You're definitely going to have more people want your picture. Uh, well, you earn the the loudest applause what was the name of the award you won at low carb denver uh the social butterfly award <laughs> everybody a thousand people in that room standing ovation like yep absolutely she <laughs> deserves it like for <laughs> sure you were the social butterfly that was fun it really was i can't wait till next year i'm ready <laughs> that's amazing you know i i have a client who's just kind of getting started in a lot of this and we've worked together a little bit with nutrition in the past, but she's now like just barely, I think, gone to a level of ketosis. And she's telling me that it's the weirdest feeling that she's waking up. She's not really hungry. She, she is forcing her food, which I'm telling her like, no, that's a great thing is now your body is burning fat. And like, you don't need to eat all the time. This is amazing. And I'm, I'm like, so do you feel a clear head? Do you feel solid energy? Do you have a good mood? Are you content? And she was like, yes, all of those things. And I just said, look, welcome to ketosis. This is what it feels like. Most human beings, I would submit a vast majority of human beings will live their entire lives without spending any appreciable time in that state. And imagine what it's like when I go to one of these conferences. And again, a thousand people in the room that all feel the same way. It's like pure love and joy to be in that environment with people that are just so energetic and feeling good and so friendly. What has been your experience going to some of these? Oh my gosh, it's amazing. And I'm pumped for like weeks afterwards too. It's just like I'm on a high from, from meeting all these people and being in ketosis is just like magical. I would have never thought, you know, I, I was told I had to eat every four hours and eat 46 grams of carbs for, per meal and 15 grams for a snack. So I was constantly eating all the time. I would, I would never, I would have never gotten into ketosis, but knowing what it's like now and how you feel it's just magical. And I want everyone to feel this way. <laughs> yeah, totally. It's it's something that's difficult in the beginning. If you're talking to somebody who doesn't know about this and they feel terrible all the time, they don't know what they don't know. And, you know, Nicole Laurent made a really good point. When we interviewed her last week. It's like, 
it's not going to be as hard as it is for you right now. What's hard is being sick. What's hard is going to your doctor and getting prescribed different medications. Being in this state is really easy. There are some changes that happen and need to happen, and it might be awkward, but it's no sacrifice to get into this state and pretty much stay there as long as you like. It's incredible. It is incredible. And um, most people think that, you know, they just need to eat around the clock and you don't. And I just want to spread the healing word, <laughs> you know, and if you're, if you're like, if you had a problem like myself, because I was, carb, I had a terrible carbohydrate sugar addiction. So I didn't want to fast right away or any, with that, because that, that was, that's a different, that's a different area. You know, you, you got to get used to eating this way and re eating real whole foods and slowly eliminating the carbohydrates before I could even think about missing a meal. Uh, yeah, it not kind of enough. Falls in place. It falls in yeah. place. And just one morning, you're like, I'm not even hungry. So, why am I going to eat? I'm going to yeah. wait. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. It's so yeah. cool. It's so cool to experience that food freedom. Now, of anybody who's had it hard in their life, I would submit that you have had it very hard in your life. I can't believe the number of things that you were dealing with at one point. Can you share a little bit about your personal story and some of the things that you've been through in your life? Absolutely. And you might think that I'm lying or that it's, <laughs> it's just a joke, but I started out, um, you know, I, I started out with, um, gestational diabetes and they had told me one good doctor did tell me, Hey, you know, you need to change what, whatever you're doing, because within 10 years you could have diabetes. Well, then it was never brought up again. No one gave me the recipe on how to do that or, or what to do. Um, to change that. And I ended up within 10 years with um, non-alcoholic fatty liver first, which I was told, you know, hey, you're, this is common. A lot of people have it. You're probably never going to get rid of it. So don't worry about it. So I didn't do anything about it. Uh, next, you know, comes hypertension. I'm needing uh, medicine for that. So I'm on two different medications for um, blood pressure. Um, you know, next, uh, was type two diabetes and it got so bad that I was on an insulin pump titration. Um, and they basically told me the diabetic educators told me, you know, you just eat what you want and give yourself a bolus and eat so many carbs a day. And you need to eat every four hours. So you don't feel bad. Um, I had gout. Oh, and then I ended up with, um, tumors. I had three grapefruit sized tumors in my uterus. So I had to have a, a, uh, a radical hysterectomy and they thought they were cancerous, but when he said he, it was a miracle that they weren't, that I wasn't just full of cancer. He thought I was going to be full when they Great. Uh, opened me up, but I wasn't, thank God. Wow. Um, grapefruit, grapefruit. Yeah. Three of them. Grapefruit size. And then, um, I was told I had a tumor in my adrenal gland which before I was diagnosed with Cushing's. So uh, he said, once I got that tumor out that I probably, everything would fall in place. I'd probably get off my, um, a lot of medications that were, I, I was on, but it didn't happen for me because they had to take out the whole adrenal and my other one had fallen asleep. Well, that put me in fight, you know, before I was in fight or flight all day long. And after they took it out, then I was like adrenal fatigued all the time because it wasn't working. So they had to give me hydrocortisone, prednisone products. Uh, they even gave me dexamethasone shots, um, which is what they give to cancer patients. Um, and I had to carry that with me in case I was in an accident or I got really sick because my body couldn't help itself. It was insane. Um, you know, and then the weight gain started happening because I was on the prednisone products uh, for so long and I was hungry all the time. Um, my body didn't make cortisol, so they were giving me cortisol um, because they said I would die without it. So without the medication. So I ended up getting to about 250 pounds. Um, I'm five foot five and I was miserable. I had sleep apnea. They made me use a CPAP. Um, just so many things, depression, you know, reflex, acid reflex. Um, I was over on over 20 medications in the insulin pump. And at one time I was on 20 lipase pills a day because my pancreas wasn't um, metabolizing the food that I was eating. So the gastroenterologist just gave me 20 lipase pills a day to get me through that, which caused me to get 
pancreatitis, acute pancreatitis, and I was in the hospital on my 40th birthday for about a week, and they had to put me on a TPN bag, and it was just nuts. That's insane. Well, yeah. okay, I, I want to go I back. Didn't, I didn't think I was going to live. <laughs> I, I don't blame you. And and yeah. I, I want to, I'll get into a little bit more of what some of those things really truly felt like, but I want to go back to the original diagnosis, gestational diabetes, you're pre-diabetic. Did they explain what would happen if you became type two diabetic? No, they just, what the one doctor had told me was, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, you, you've gotten this. Um, I'll send you to a nutritionist. Um, I did actually lose 20 pounds while I was pregnant at the end because I did start measuring my foods at the time. So I was kind of restricting um, things while I was pregnant at the end. Um, but no one ever said, hey, you really need to eliminate sugar. You need to eliminate flour. You need to take this really serious because this is what's going to happen if you don't. <laughs> Your eyesight, your, you know, yeah. the neuropathy, like, like all of the things that come with it, the way higher likelihood of cancer or dementia or all the things that come with it. It's, it's horrific. And I don't think enough people know how terrible the disease actually is, regardless of what you decide to do to treat it. Right. And I'm glad you mentioned eyesight because I go to the doctor, eye doctor all the time. And I, my vision changed a lot during this time frame. I had, I would you know, I didn't really, I wasn't taking my blood sugars or anything because I hadn't been di diagnosed with diabetes yet, but I had three or four different pairs of glasses that I would go through, you know, well, let's see which one fit works today. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's crazy. Okay. So how, how is all of this feeling? And, and I, I understand that all of these different conditions are really the same problem. It's, it's just different branches of the same trunk on the same tree, but these things can feel differently. So pick a few of your favorites, like sleep apnea. Explain what it's truly like to have sleep apnea and how much your life has changed or diabetes or blood pressure. Any, pick your favorites and explain some of the things that come along with those. Well, uh, diabetes for one, um, you know, it's a carbohydrate disease. It's, it's you're eating too much. No one ever told me that until I met Dr. Siwas. He, he, he told, he showed me, Hey, it's a carbohydrate addiction disease and you are addicted to carbohydrates. Um, you know, I couldn't, I'd have headaches, debilitating headaches where I would, migraines where I would have to miss work, you know. Um, my feet, I thought I had plantar flatulitis, so that went away afterwards too. So, um, you know, and then the CPAP at night, uh, you know, I couldn't breathe. My husband sometimes would go to the couch because he couldn't he couldn't sleep with me either because I was so loud. Um, it's just horrible. And then I had to wear an insulin pump. So, you know, I couldn't go swimming, but for a small amount of time, even like to go to take a shower, I would wrap it with saran wrap so that I wouldn't lose the device. Even, you know, to even to have sex with your husband, you got to un unhook it and you got to think about that. And you worry about it the whole time, you know, don't, don't mess with my device. I don't want it to pay 70 more dollars to get another one. You know, it's, yeah. it's a horrible disease and you, you lose your eyes. Um, every morning I, you know, I just didn't want to walk. I was tired in the middle of the day. I wanted to go home and sleep. I didn't want to go to any of my kids were all, um, in high school and they're all very active in different things. And I, it, it was all I could do to go to their sporting events um, I had to force myself. I didn't want to get my picture taken. And look at me now, pictures all over the place. Uh, wanting to pick a picture with everybody. Um, I don't know. It was just horrible. And I don't know why anyone would want to live this way if they had a choice, if they knew they had a choice. Hey, you know, eliminate sugar, eliminate flour, eliminate grains. They all turn to sugar in your body and you can live a magical life. <laughs> Yeah, it's incredible. No, and, and and to think that all of that really is food and food system related. And all of those things are preventable. You do not have to suffer with any of those things. I would strongly submit. And it all comes from the foods that we eat. And just because something says it's a food doesn't mean it's really that great for us if we put it in our bodies. Yeah, and there needs to be more out there on insulin resistance and what it does to your body and what it means and, and what happens if you continue doing what you're doing? Because it just one thing after another, <laughs> just one yeah. thing. 
And I didn't know that, you know, your body only needed one teaspoon of sugar a day to live and your liver makes it on its own. You don't even have to eat it. Yeah, you that's right. You don't even have to eat it. That's right. Yeah, it's amazing. I, we do the same. We live a zero, essentially zero carbohydrate diet. And I always have just the right, perfect amount for anything that I'm doing. It's amazing. Totally different than what it was before. So can you identify some kind of like rock bottom where everything was like just the worst? Oh, gosh. There are so many things through the years. And even with my segment, my second um, pregnancy, um, he ended up being 11 pounds. And I, it was horrible. They didn't even figure out that I had diabetes till I was halfway through uh, the second pregnancy. So um, that was really bad. Um, rock bottom was just at the end, right before I ended up connecting with Dr. Sai was because I just couldn't. I was just so depressed and that was on two different kinds of medications. I didn't understand. I didn't understand why it was happening to me. Um, I had been so full of life before and how could I stop it? I was always hungry and I tell people that and they didn't understand why I could be so hungry all the time. <laughs> I was just so hungry all the time. I tried weight watchers. I tried restricting. I even tried before I got too heavy, I even tried running obsessively all the time. I was doing half marathons. I probably did like eight half marathons and I was way too heavy probably to be doing those. Um, my daughter with me, um, but you just kind of have many addictions. Addictions like one illness, many outlets. So you reach yeah. for others when you try to give up one. Um, you know, and I think sugar and food addiction it's not taken seriously because you have to eat, right? You gotta have to, you have to eat to live. So people don't take it serious, but it's very serious. It's the most serious of all. Yeah, it really sounds that way. And look, I didn't know Tia back then. I only know current, bubbly, happy, enthusiastic, <laughs> taking pictures with everybody, Tia. So to try to even imagine a different human, it's, it's, it's so different. Like that, that makes me sad. <laughs> knowing you and knowing how you approach life, you were, you were probably always bubbly and happy when all of these things are happening and to hear about you like depressed, like, Oh, breaks my heart. Yeah. And you know, my, my kids noticed that and my daughter, especially she's like, mom, we got to do something. You got to do something. You're not going to be, I'm not married yet. You know, I, I want you to be at my wedding and celebrate my life moments and um, please get some help. What can we do to help? You know? Yeah. What about the, your family's health? How are they doing with their health? Well, everybody's doing great. I'm very, I'm very blessed. Um, my husband had RA and he noticed me along his journey, of, of, along my journey, all the things that were happening and all the benefits and he took it on too. So he doesn't have any lumps on his hands. He had nodules everywhere. They're gone. His RA inflammation is gone. Um, he gets out there and runs every morning. Um, he, you know, he works out, um, both my son and my daughter have taken it on. She had migraines, terrible migraines, um, from all the carby foods that she'd eat. She liked pasta, uh, you know, Mexican and, uh, you know, uh, Oriental's got all the sugar and grains and saucies on them. Uh, she liked all that stuff. And she ended up actually meeting with Benton Johnson and doing a sugar, uh, diagnostic tool with her and, um, she hasn't had migraine since. Wow. That's amazing. Sugar from her diet. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. It's, it's no surprise when you've been in this world for this long that that would happen. But initially when you start learning about those things, you're like, wow, you made migraines go away. That's like so crazy. Now it's always interesting. Most people in this world have some kind of an origin story. They met the right person or somebody gave them a Gary Taub's book or a Nina Teichel's book. And I'm yeah. always so curious, like, why was it that and not something different? How did you find the perfect doctor when you could have found a thousand other doctors that have no idea about nutrition? And like, how did it happen that you met Dr. Silas? Well, it's a really cool story. Actually, my cousin, um, who's much younger than me, and he's like a body, he's really into fitness and lifting weights and really watches what he eats. I went to New Mexico and took and visited and he was just flabbergasted at the amount of weight I had. I mean, I I was like double myself and how I just wanted to lay down and I didn't want to go out to dinner with them. I went to, you know, of course, eat some carby foods when nobody was watching. <laughs> um, I just, he just couldn't imagine it. And he said, you know what? He said, 
why don't you, um, I've, I've heard of this guy called the carb addiction doc. I just watched a few of his videos. Let's see if we can get you an appointment. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm okay. You know, I'll be all right. And he's like, no, you know, I'll pay for it. <laughs> I'll pay for it. Whatever we got to do, let's just get you an appointment. So, uh, you know, with my husband and I were like, can't hurt nothing. We've tried everything else. You're on all these medications. Um, nothing seems to be working. You just keep, seem to be getting sicker. And every time you go to the doctor, it's another pill. So we um, we had our meeting over uh, just over the phone. We just had a phone meeting, and he's like, "Tia, you're a carb. You're addicted to carbs. You are a carbohydrate addict." And and I'm like, "What is that?" He's like, "You know, same as an alcoholic is, you know, alcohol is to an alcoholic or heroin to a drug addict. Yours is sugar and carbs." And a light, it was like a light bulb moment for me because I could see, oh yeah, I would wait till everybody would leave the house and eat that whole bag, family size bag of cheese puffs. Why did I wait? Because I didn't want them to see it because I was ashamed. You know, I mean, it just all just, it was like something clicked in me and I'm like, I can do this. And he said, I can help you, but you got to do what I say. <laughs> Wow. And, and if all you know this Dr. Said, Silas, he's like real, authority, you know, you don't, you don't want to disappoint him. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. No. And all of this was on the first appointment. Like he told you yeah. directly and, to your face, you are a sugar addiction or sugar addict, excuse me, on your first appointment. Yeah. Yeah. And he, you know what? He, I told him all the drugs I was on, all the medications. And he said, if you're going to do this, um, I'm go we're going to take away half the insulin right now today. And we're going to take away a whole bunch of other things. He took it. He's like, why are you on all these? You're on these statins. You don't need to be on this. You don't need to be on that. You're on too many things. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, are you sure? Are you sure? He's like, if you're going to do what I say, if you're going to, you know, eliminate as many carbohydrates as you can, you're not going to need these. Everything's going to be too strong. So. So he was painting that picture for you. He was painting that picture for you of like what life could potentially be and that you could get off these meds and procedures and all this other stuff. Right. And he told me every time he said, don't do drive by Sia. He said, it's just an emotional event. Every time you go into that refrigerator, ask yourself, are you bored? Are you hungry? Did you just eat? Why are you in here? <laughs> so wow. we put, we, you know, we put notes up everywhere and, and I did sit down with my family and tell them, Hey, you know, I have a problem. This is a serious problem. I'm sick and I need your help. And I need you to get rid, help me get rid of all the carbohydrates in the house. So if you got any potato chips in here, or if you got any cookies, I don't want to see them because I can't stop eating them. And when you're gone, I eat them. And my daughter busted me. She found me. I like had gotten into her uh, chocolate morsels because she was actually working for a pastry chef uh, at one of the top in the country. She, he, she could make some good stuff. Anyway, I'd gotten into the morsels. I thought she'll never notice and hid them in my underwear drawer. I've told people this before. And she knew right away the next day when she went in, she's like, some are missing. She's like, mom, did you take some of those out of there? And I'm like, yeah, I did. And she's like, show me where they're at right now. I wanna see where they're at. So wow. she went with me. So we, after that week, we all just kind of like cleaned out the cabinets, the nothing processed. So to anything in a box we took out, we gave it. I know it might sound bad, but we did. We gave it to the shelter because there are people yeah. need out there. I don't want to make them sick too, but <laughs> we gave yeah, them to the food. Mm -hmm. mm. Wow. Okay. So I was going to ask how, how was the family's response? Were they very supportive? Did they push back a little bit? Like I, well, if you told me when I was 12 that I couldn't access the potato chips and, and fruit snacks, I, I wouldn't be too supportive. I would say. Right. Right. Well, lucky, luckily, uh, I wish I would have known this earlier in their, when they were 12, but I didn't. Uh, I feel, I feel bad about that now, but now they, now the awareness, they have the awareness there and they know, and they're very, very supportive. So uh, anything bad, even if we're out to eat and I say, well, I'd like to try that. And they're like, really? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> you still want to try stuff like that, mom? You know what they did to you before. <laughs> you know? That's hilarious. Yeah. That reminds me of the, that reminds me of the Super Bowl commercial. I can't remember. I think it's probably Geico where the guy tries to lose weight. So he hires like three middle school girls who like sit in the back of his car. <laughs> and like anytime he's about to like take a bite of a cheeseburger, they're like, ew, gross. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, it's fun just to mess with them every now and then say, you know, Good. that big cookie. <laughs> Good. Wow. And there's too many keto treats out there now. People don't realize, you know, a lot of that stuff is just crap. So don't yeah. even go there. 
I, wanna... I, I agree. I think there might be some utility if somebody's just starting and they're trying to get off of sugar, but I, I, I agree with you. I think there's too many products and I think people try to hang on to the thought that I can still enjoy lots of sweet things. And so they try all these bridges when it's like, I really think you need to get off of sweet things of any kind, artificial or not. What do you think? Oh, drinks is the first one to go, you know, get, get rid of the drinks, <laughs> you know, just in some people need to go slow like that. Start with just the drinks. And then once you are off the drinks for a little while, then, you know, uh, start maybe uh, eliminate anything with seed oils in it, you know, just educate yeah. yourself that way. But it's really important to know, you know, the difference between a harmful user and an addict, because if you're a harmful user, moderation is okay. But if you're addicted, if you're a true addicted person, you definitely need to eliminate it. Because yeah. just like you've heard before, I mean, you don't give a little bit of heroin on Tuesdays to a heroin addict. Same with the sugar carb addiction person. You don't want to give them just a little bit every now and then and just keep them dangling. You know, you got to get, you got to eliminate it all. <laughs> yeah. So, so interesting. So before we get into some of the addiction stuff, I want to go back to your journey. And and first of all, did it only take the one meeting with Dr. Cyrus before you were like, yes, this is what I'm doing? Uh, well, that got me going. He gave me a kind of a food list of, uh, um, omni carnivore food list is what he put me on to begin to begin with to get me to kind of to a carnivore he's switching me over slowly to a carnivore way of eating to eliminate uh all my medications because that was my that was my reason for going I wanted to get off the medications and the weight just kind of came with it it melted with it once I eliminated all those medications I was on because some of them kind of kept me sick <laughs> The, the statins and the, the um, hydrocortisone and all those raise, raise my sugars up even more. Yeah, yeah and the side effects yeah, we, of those drugs zoomed, are, are terrible. We Zoomed uh, every two weeks for a while and then went down to every month. And okay. would zoom and he would give me goals mm -hmm. and um, I would do it. Then he would do my blood work and he would see on my blood work how I was doing. Oh, you're doing great. You're doing what I say, you know? Or uh, maybe one one month, my numbers go up a little bit, but he'll see where and he would know, okay, so what you've been doing, um, maybe give him a food log. He would give, have me give him a food log and he would say, okay, well, there's your problem right there. Why are you eating this? You know, we need to eliminate yeah. that. Or, um, you know, I did keep a food log also about and how I would feel after I would eat something. I, I for and, and he also gave me a CGM so I could see which was the best tool ever in getting me my getting me to reverse my type 2 diabetes because you can see what foods what they do in your body and it's the best tool ever and I think every diabetic should have one. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree. So mm -hmm. helpful. What amazing coaching. What a great example to you who would later become a coach to be able to learn coaching in that way. Like let's talk about how you're doing, what things did you do well, what things can we work on? Here's a goal. What do you think? What do you want to do? So often I, I, all of my clients, I know yours too, they're creating their own plan and they're deciding how much they want to go. And they're just using a coach to just help them create some yeah. ideas and decide what they're going to do. Everybody's different. Some people need to go low, slow, and some people got, can dive right in and they're fine, but yeah. you got to find out what works for you. And as far as movement goes in the beginning, I was too big and I didn't want to exercise. But as soon as I started feeling better and my energy levels were getting up and the ketones were kicking in and um, I got some fat loss going. I'm like, you know, I think I'm going to take a walk. And the next nice. thing you know, I'm taking a walk every day. And the next thing you know, I'm walking three and four miles a day or, you know, and then I'm talking to him and he's like, you know, why don't you try walking after your biggest meal of the day? That's going to help your numbers go down. I'm like, really? Walk right after that. I've always been told not to let your food digest for a long time. <laughs> Get on out there. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> the rumor was true, maybe for swimming, but not for walking, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. So, so yeah, I get asked all the time, like, when when should I see a difference? If I start eating this way, when should I see a difference? And I said, see a difference 
might be a different thing, but feel a difference, it's probably going to be pretty quick. Like, again, there's an awkward kind of transition phase where you might not feel great. You're taking away an entire energy source that your body understands is the only energy source. So that's that's not going to be that pleasant. There's ways to get through it a little easier. But but like what you're going to feel is going to be way quicker. And that could be within weeks or even days that you're just feeling totally different. And, you know, I told that I'd always have my non-alcoholic fatty liver and it was the first to go. And, and he knew from my blood work, he's like, you know what? You don't even have a non-alcoholic fatty liver anymore. Within three months, it was healed. That's amazing. Wow. How many so, medications are you on today? Anybody that's listening out there, you can do it too. <laughs> Just that's eliminate amazing. sugar and flour. Your non-alcoholic fatty liver will eventually be gone. Uh, but I'm not on any medications today other than some DHA uh, supplements. I take some supplements. That's amazing. That's so different than taking 20 different prescriptions. I know. Can you believe it? I would have never dreamed. Never. Never. Congratulations. Just nutrition. Just nutrition is all. And walking. Congratulations. And, you know, thanks. You got to look at the non-scale victories too. I used to be one of those people in the beginning that would just pop on that scale all the time. And even Amy Berger's like, Hey, the non-scale victories are the best ones. When your pants start getting looser, your mind starts clearing up, you feel like going out to do stuff, you know you're getting better. That's amazing. Wow. Okay. Such a cool story. I want to get into the addiction thing, and I want to set this up by saying, let's pretend that I don't know anything about addiction, okay? Let's just talk like potential implications. Let's say you told me that smoking cigarettes is addictive. Okay, I might think like, well, I kind of don't really need to smoke anyway. It's a little gross and kind of expensive, not really my thing. So that's fine. Um, cocaine, snorting cocaine is really addictive. Well, that's also fine because I don't know where the local drug dealers are. It's not easily yeah. accessible for me. Yeah. I, I'm sure it's around, but it's not around <laughs> me. So I can't find any heroin. Same thing. I don't know where to find it. If you told me that carbohydrates and sugar in particular are addictive, I'm going to go out into the world and go, Holy smokes, we've got a big, big, big problem because you can find sugar and carbohydrates everywhere, everywhere very inexpensively and easily. My hardware store sells candy bars. Like there's vending yeah. machines at my hockey rink that I play at. Like it, it, if we're saying that carbohydrates and sugar are addictive, then we have a massive problem. Yeah. And you know, they, they've created marketing created the bliss point years ago for us to, to stay addicted to, to things. It's crazy. And addiction really isn't about what happens. And it, it's, it's about what happens in a person's brain when they're exposed to rewarding substances, psychoactive drugs, or rewarding behaviors, which is processes. So, I mean, it's chronic and progressive. It's more chronic and progressive progressive, you know, type 2 diabetes is not chronic and progressive. You can stop it. But addiction is chronic and pro pro progressive. And behavior change is the only way for long-term healing. You have to change your behavior. It's the only way. And a group support is magical. Group support is magical. I had to have group support eventually because it got to be tough without a, a group of like-minded people to cheer you on and, and help you, or just call, you know, for accountability, buddy, just say, Hey man, I want to eat that. Can, what can you, yeah. can you help me walk me through this? I gotta, I got, I, I got it real bad. You know, it's it sounds no different than Alcoholics Anonymous. No, it's not. And it's a lot of lying, hiding and sneaking. And I did a lot of lying, hiding and sneaking to my family over the years to go eat. And I would not just eat like one pizza pizza. I might buy myself a whole large pizza and eat it. Wow. When they weren't home. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. I wow. can't even it's, imagine doing that now. <laughs> yeah. That, yeah. I know that you've come so far. It's interesting to think about that now. And, and again, I want to just reiterate you in, in your mind, you are 100% you are convinced that carbohydrates and sugar are addictive because there are some people out there that say it's not, I think that's a little ludicrous at this point, but is there any question in your mind that carbohydrates oh. and sugar are addictive? They, it's really, it's very real and it's chronic and they think it's a mild addiction, but it's not because sugar is everywhere. It's everywhere and it lights up your brain. They have scans that they can do where 
it'll light up your brain more than cocaine when you do an MRI. Have you seen those studies? It's amazing. Yeah, I it's, have. It's crazy. It's really sick. And, you know, we, we promote sugar cereals and it happens when we're small. It starts when you're very, very small. Yeah. It's not your fault. And that's what people need to know. It's not their fault. You can get a plan for treatment to protect yourself. And when you find out it's a brain illness and it's not your fault, you can do something about it. Yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting when we think back on the history of how we started to find sugar and refine it. We found an ingredient we really liked. And so we started yeah. to ship it, make it really cheap, cheap and ship it out everywhere. You almost wonder what what would have happened if that substance would have been cocaine. And to think that like child parties could be cocaine parties. And, you know, when, when you're sad, you just do some cocaine. And when you're happy, you just do some cocaine. Got a promotion. Let's do a whole bunch of cocaine. Like what we we would abhor thinking about a world like that, knowing what we know about drugs, yet here we are with the same problem where you're right, it's just everywhere, even in the womb. Like think about the baby coming out of a mother who's gestational diabetic, that baby is already conditioning itself to be in a high glucose world where it needs to be pumping out more insulin. And it's, it's a dopamine rush, you know, everywhere. And so we constantly want that high. Once we start, you feel that way. That's why you feel like crap when you eliminate it because you've been getting that high and your reward centers are all lit up and you're looking for your next fix. <laughs> yeah, terrible. It's terrible. Yeah. So tell us about the different types of addicts. I thought that was really interesting. Well, you okay, so you could be a social user, which I kind of talked to you about that. You never get obsessed. You never lose control over it. There's, you know, there's no consequences. You don't get craving. We call that a normie. So there's social users. Um, I'm definitely not a, a normie. And then there's a harmful, a harmful user um, where you eat by culture. You don't really know better. You don't have any knowledge. You eat because maybe you're stressed or you're unhappy. Um, you don't really understand addiction, but moderation does work for a harmful user. So moderation is okay for them. You ask them um, why they're doing it. Why are you eating? You know, you, you ask them why. But with an addict, you ask, how can I help? How can I help you? Because an addict, at one that's addicted is pathological use. So they have a loss of control around the food. Um, it's what happens in their brain when they have, when they eat it. So moderation is not going to work for them and they have to have abstinence. And that would be someone like myself where I have to have abstinence because once I eat it and I've had some relapses over the last five years, I've had a few relapses and I thought, well, I'll just participate and eat one. Well, then all, that's all I would think about for days. And then, yeah. You know, then it, next thing you know, it's been a couple of weeks to go into a month or a year. Luckily, that didn't happen to me because I came clean with my family that I messed up and we helped me get me back on. But I mean, some people think that's crazy that I'm doing this over food, but it's very real. <laughs> it's very yeah. real. Yeah, we had a dietitian. I really appreciated this quote. and I really liked it. And this quote was something about like moderation and like new, good human nutrition means that sometimes you overconsume, sometimes you underconsume, sometimes you celebrate events with people and it's about culture and it, it's not so much about measuring and tracking and all this stuff. And through my nutritional journey, I have loved that quote and I am so jealous of anybody who can approach it that way. And as much as I love that quote, I know that myself and you and many, many other people out there have to abstain. They have to be abstainers. Maybe if it's not even the one thing, it's the, the, the cascade of events that that triggers afterwards is just terrible. And, and for some people, they, you, can't, you can't touch it. I felt shame. I felt so much shame. And it's not there anymore. So I know um, attempting to moderate whenever you're addicted it's just, it just makes it deeper and deeper into your illness, you know, just brings you deeper and deeper into it. So you definitely don't want to moderate. And then it, there's denial. You have denial. Well, I can just eat one or, you know, I can just go out with the girls this one night and have one, but you just got to learn how to protect yourself, plan and protect yourself from yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what I tell yeah. people. 
That's amazing. Well, you've got so many certifications with this. I want to start off by talking about the certification you have with Bitten Johnson, just a legend in this world. And and I would love to learn about her program, Sugar, the Sugar program that we mentioned in the introduction is an acronym. So maybe we could go through that. But can you tell us about some of the things you learned in particular with that program? Yeah, and, and sugar doesn't mean just sugar, the white stuff. Sugar is any highly palatable food that's going to make you keep wanting it. It's, you know, grains, flour, sugar. And, you know, the bread, people that are addicted to bread are even harder to get off uh, sugar than the rest of us. Good point. It's, there's a gut, there's something in the gut microbiome um, in the gluten that does something. So it makes it harder for us to get. And I used to love bread. So that was really hard. We, those are the ones that want to, you know, try to find the, the different keto bread options and <laughs> make different kinds of stuff that looks like bread. But sugar is a diagnostic tool. It's based on DSM-5 and ICD-10. Um, it's the only one like it in the world, and it has inherited validity from ADIS, which is Alcohol Drug Diagnostic Instrument, um, if you're not familiar with that. It, but it screens not only this diagnostic school, tool, which is like 69 or 67 questions. I'm not, I can't remember how many there are, but it screens for depression, for general anxiety disorder, uh, PTSD, stress, nicotine, caffeine, subscription pills, and gambling. And at the end, um, most clients will say that's the first time they felt like they've ever been heard because you talk about so many things in there. Um, and then you can give them, you, you'll give them a treatment plan. Um, and it's really cool because you can um, print it off and give it to your doctors. You can give them to your dietitians. Um, uh, it just lays out everything. It actually shows a curve uh, from your lifetime because you uh, talk about if the current symptom is happening now, if it's been in 12 months ago or 12 weeks um, or a year, or if it's been more than a year and then you took like you have your age you're like when did this happen you when did you first remember this happening um so there's like a curve and it shows you your own personal journey of how you are addicted to these things and it's just a magical wow wow so so that must be the most comprehensive kind of way that you could screen for addiction right and it'll tell you whether at the end you'll know whether you're a harmful user uh and if you're an active user because if you've you know, been using within the last 12 months, then you're probably, or two weeks, you, you're probably still have a lot of active addictions going on. And, you know, addiction is, it affects every part of your life, physical, psychological, social, and um, biological. So your health, your mood, your family, your friends, uh, hobbies, work, it affects everything. It affects your whole life. Um, so physical might be vol volatile blood sugars, um, type 2 diabetes, weight gain, uh, fatigue, stomach problems. Um, psychological would be mood swings, false feelings, you know, low depression, um, anxiety or isolation. I did a lot of isolating. Um, social might be communication problems or relationship issues, um, work-related problems, um, feelings of being different and losing friends. Uh, spiritual might be loss of uh, meaning, maybe you losing your faith, um, fear and worry all the time. And you need a lot of biochemical repair. And it, it takes time for this because you're, you're, you didn't get here fast. You got here you know, it took you a while to get here. So teaching people how to, to deal with stress, sleep better. I use sleep tape. It's magical. I, oh, take the best. At, I take my mouth at night and I haven't used a CPAP for years now since I've lost my weight, but the sleep tape really does help. Yeah, my husband would totally like does. me to put it on like may, way earlier in the evening. <laughs> <laughs> I joke about with, that with Bethany too. You no, put that that's, tape on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. No, that's amazing. I'm hearing that list. And just based on what you told us about your story, you just checked off a whole lot of your own boxes and things that you were dealing with. Yeah. I mean, and you know, you have to, people need to know that they need to, they're going to expect to be, they need to expect to be uncomfortable. 
vulnerable when they're going through something like that, to be aware of all their thoughts and that thoughts are optional. Tracy taught me that all thoughts are optional. You know, your thoughts can't make you eat that piece of pie or that, that cookie that you want. And your mind wants predictability because it feels safe. It feels safe there. And uh, we have power. We have powers within us to make our own choices. And I didn't really realize that I could make my own choices. You know, awareness is everything. Bitten always told me uh, knowledge is power. Um, here, I got it wrote down here. I like it a lot. Knowledge gives hope. Hope gives willingness. Willingness gives action. And action gives results. I love that. I, I like that a lot. <laughs> I love that. Wow. Okay. So you've already told us a few things that can help. It sounds like the group therapy can really help. You told us mindfulness practices, I'm assuming, can help if you're trying to separate yourself from your thoughts. You do need to see them as passing clouds, or I think Tracy describes them as buses. They're buses that go by, but that doesn't mean you need to jump on the bus. You can just watch right. the buses go by. Yeah, which is, I love that. Yeah, mindfulness, the practice of like watching our thoughts and just uh, observing them and not doing anything. What are some of the other tools available to you as a coach and a practitioner that you can help people with so that they can be, they, they can heal themselves from addiction? Well, you just got to accept the addiction and learn that it's about the brain. You know, once you accept that you have an addiction, you can deal with it. Um, and again, sleeping breathing techniques, knowing that you, abstinence um, from your drug of choice, and knowing that nobody's 100% perfect 100% of the time, and you're going to mess up, but you're going to get back on. Um, I don't know. It's not your fault. I just want to tell everybody when screaming to the rooftop that this food addiction, sugar addiction is not your fault. Um, you know, we've been programmed for a long time to eat these things and commercials, <laughs> you know, all the sugar is in everything. There's 100 names for sugar, hidden names that you don't even know. Know the ingredients in your food. That's what I, you know, look at the back of it. If it's got a long ingredient list, don't eat it. And first of all, you don't need anyone to understand uh, what you're doing. It's your life. It's your journey. Um, you want to show others how you, that you see things as your own choice and that you can change with different thinking. Yeah. You know, and to notice when snacking becomes habitual, you know, cause it, if it's starting to become habitual, then you know, you're like heading in the wrong direction and it can happen so quick. So yeah. easy. Yep. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. We mentioned other certifications that you've taken and trying to cut them down to make your introduction was very challenging. You've done a lot of really cool programs with people out there. Can you talk about some of the ones that stand out the most to you? Well, Nutrition Network, um, I, well, Doc encouraged me to help other people uh, since I was able to do this, that I, there are so many others that can do it too. You just have to have some courage and step out of your comfort zone and, um, I, he joined, he uh, encouraged me to be part of the Society of Metabolic Health Professionals, and I followed the Nutrition Network path. Um, if you're not already a medical professional, you can take these courses through Nutrition Network to become accredited member of the Society of Metabolic Health Professionals. And the courses were so fun. And you could do them at your own rate. Uh, at your own pace and you didn't, you know, there wasn't any time limitations on them. You could do them after work. You could, instead of reading a book or watching a movie, you could listen to the videos and um, you have to answer some questions at the end, but they're magical. And I, I was like, man, I'd really like to be a coach. And they offered a coach practitioner program. So I followed that and I was one of their first 12 to graduate. And um, it was the best experience that I've ever had. And I've met so many people along the way got so many people that I can, um, colleagues that I can reach out to for help if needed. And I'm currently um, uh, asked to been a tutor in the next 12. So it's really been kind of neat. I get to kind of go through the course again right now. That's amazing. Oh, that's um, so cool. Yeah. And then actually um, I met Bitten Johnson there in that training. And, uh, you know, my brain lit up when she's a sugar addiction specialist. And I'm like, I gotta, I gotta get more from her. So um, I'm currently in her holistic medication for addiction 
course because I wanted to learn more about biochemical repair and how I can help people with that. So that's where I'm doing now and I love it. Mm -hmm. That's great. So just to clarify something, we get asked about this all the time, but a lot of people listening to this podcast will have had some amazing story of themselves, like curing diseases and finding low carbohydrate diets for various number of reasons. They might want to be able to help other people. And I think the the common thought is like, I would love to help somebody, but I didn't go to school for eight years. I'm not a doctor. There's really nothing I can do. You're saying you, there's lots of things that you can do. Oh, yeah. There is lots of things you can do to get out there and be a coach. You know, if, you know, if you want to get off medications and stuff, you need to be under a doctor's care, but you can coach people uh, to eat the proper human diet. You can coach people and be their personal cheerleader and get them on board uh, for proper nutrition and a ketogenic lifestyle um, that heals their bodies of so many things. Even people with PTOS have found benefits from this. Uh, there's many out there. There's so many things that uh, this way of eating, just getting sugar out of your diet and flour, it just heals your body and your mind. Yeah. That's well, the still, biggest thing. Yeah. Why wouldn't you want to try it for a while? I just encourage anybody listening to try it for 30 days. See what happens. Love it. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, that's amazing. So you've got all these different ways to help people, but you're also the director of nutrition services. Did I say that right? In a hospital? Yeah, I'm, basically, I'm a dietary manager at a hospital. <laughs> so, the director of nutritional services. Yeah. Okay, we hear all the time how difficult that setting is to be able to leverage to help people eat a better diet. What is that like for you? What has been your experience with that? Well, here's the thing. I basically do the operations of the department and, um, you know, the ordering of the food, um, making sure everybody's fed throughout the hospital. But the registered dietitian is the one that does the patient menus and is they have the degree that tells the patients what they should eat for each specific diet. So like if they're on a heart healthy or they're on a diabetic, they they have education from the RD because they're the diabetic educator, which I am not allowed to do because I don't, I don't have those credentials. Um, I can't chart in a patient record. So um, I can be reached after work. People reach me in the community. They see my journey. They reach me after work. And uh, we try to, I try to set them up with a low carb physician when possible by going to the SMHP website or nutrition, or even Tracy McBee's low carb healing hub has some physicians that um, are listed on those, but all those places you can get set up with a low carb doc. Cause it's really important if you are on medications to be under a doctor's care. But as far as the, the hospital setting, it's very, very hard for me at times because um, I don't want to see a diabetic patient eating pancakes. <laughs> I don't want to see them eating biscuits, you know? Right. But well, I, was, I was just going to say, you're, you're not in charge of the individual and what they eat, but do you have any pull or say in like, you know, can we order more chicken breast than we order like chips and candy bars? Or is that just kind of out of your control? That's kind of, you know, we still have all the vending machines out front, um, all that stuff in there. I'd like to make it to where it was just diet drinks, if it, even that to get the sugar loaded out off for the, um, I feed the staff. I feed the staff. So I try to give them options out there. We did, we did implement uh, several keto options out there because people were asking. So instead of making a vegetable with uh, sugar on them, or, you know, we'll put a plain vegetable out, a real whole food vegetable, or maybe instead of a candied ham, we just do a baked ham instead of having the candy on it. Or instead of fried chicken, we'll have baked chicken one day. So at least somebody can be conscious of what they're eating that's cool do you personally know of any like uh success stories from the staff that started yeah eating that way? yeah there is several and i uh, i even have um several people in the community that um have had bariatric surgery and has reached out for help because they know that you know the statistics are really high for them to regain their weight so they know that they need to really focus on low carb nutrition to keep them from going backwards so 
Well, it's cool. Yeah. It's an interesting juxtaposition of what you get to see and do witnessing firsthand what's going on in the hospitals, but also being able to help people as soon as you're done. Let's talk about that work after work. What are some of your favorite success stories there? Um, well, I just had, I just met someone in Florida that I've been talking to um, in person, which was really cool. And uh, she gave me a shout out on um, Facebook. It was really neat. Uh, my dad, my dad has one of those doorbell things, you know, that does movies. I'm, I don't, I'm not up on that stuff, but anyway, Funny. he, uh, he uh, took a video on his doorbell of us meeting each other. It was really neat. Ah, uh, <laughs> that's great. Yeah. But I have lots of stories, lots of stories of people uh, healing and losing weight and just feeling better, you know, about themselves. And also what's good is they get to be examples for their own children. I'd like to get the word out more in the schools in the communities. Um, and I've joined the advocacy committee with the SMHP, hoping um, we've got a few educational tools out there about CGMs, because um, there's a lot of uh, physicians that don't use CGMs, but maybe we'll get more on board for using them. Yeah, it always makes me curious, like, I'll ask you what you think, like, do you think, do you envision a day where, like, systemic change might actually happen, or do we still just need to work at the individual level as much as we can with the people, people who are very sick of being sick, or open to trying something new? Is that pretty much the only way this message is going to be moved forward? Yeah, I, I don't know if, if I'm hoping we'll see it in our day, but I, I don't know, it's, we've got a lot of work to do, we need more people on board, we need to get as many people out there, so... If you've got healing in your body from doing this, you need to get out there and and spread the word. <laughs> Please help the us. Healing word. Yeah. However, however you can, in whatever way that you possibly can. If that is doing a podcast, if that is doing coaching, if that's going to conferences, if that is helping your children inside the home, like there is something that you can do. And I love that call to action for everybody that we all need to do our part and we need to share this because this is really important. And thinking back on you and your life and everything you were suffering with, imagine what could have happened if you would have never had that recommendation to change your life. You know what I mean? Like that would have been yeah. a very sad ending, I think. It would have been, and I, and I probably wouldn't be here today because uh, I was at my, I felt like I was at the end five years ago. So it's just really a miracle. And yeah. and I want everybody else to have the miracle too. <laughs> well, that's fantastic. Yeah. What a great way to end this show. And again, ending it with just such a bubbly and amazing and energetic person. It's been so much fun. I was so glad I was able to uh, meet you in person. I'm glad to uh, hook up with you again in August, I believe. Are you going to San Diego? Yes. Yeah. Yay. I'll be there. I'll be there. <laughs> Can't wait. I will be there. I just booked my trip. It's it's fun to think like this is this is if I wasn't going to these, I would be going on vacations, right? Like this is my vacation. This is what I spend money on and spend my weekends on and travel for. Like San Diego, I would love to go to the zoo or sit on the beach or whatever. And I might get to I... have a day of that, but it's like I'm gonna go to San Diego to spend time with all of my best friends learning more about this stuff. That's how important it is to me. And I know how important that is to you. Yeah, it is. It's great. And I can't wait for the next one. I'm actually going to Tennessee as well. I can't wait for that one. Buzz is Very cool. <laughs> nice. Oh, our mutual <laughs> friend, Buzz, Buzz and Bruce. Yeah. Uh, shout out yeah. to those guys. <laughs> uh, <laughs> amazing. Well, Tia, where can people go to find you to connect with you and your work? Well, um, you can find me on Instagram at Tia Reed. Um, you can find me on Facebook. Um, you can reach out to me on the Low Carb Healing Hub has me listed there. The SMHP has me listed as a provider and I'm also listed on Bitten's Addiction as a sugar and licensed addiction specialist there. People, people can find you. Yep. <laughs> You're everywhere. I'm just sitting here. I've got a list of all the links of, yeah. of places you could contact. You named about half. There's like still like five or six more. Yeah. <laughs> people yeah. can find you. People can find Love you it. and they will be very, very happy when they do. Because again, you're just such a bright light in the space. I'm so grateful for everything that you learned and the help that you got and your enthusiasm to go out and share that message with others is so totally infectious and the world needs more Tia Reads for sure. So <laughs> thank, thank you. Rock. Thank you. Thank you so very much. <laughs> thank you for appearing on our show today. We really appreciate you. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye. And this has been another episode of Balanced Body Radio.